Okay, guys, moving on to number 18. We have a rational function, and they want us to graph it and fill in all of the blanks, okay? So um, for rational functions, the first thing I always do is I go ahead and factor the top and the bottom so that we can, we can get a better look at what, what we're dealing with, right? So the top, I can take out a 2x, and I'll have a 2x, and then x minus 1. And then the bottom, uh, you can factor that. What you end up getting is x minus 6, and then x plus 3. Okay, if you want to go ahead and check that, if you FOIL the bottom, you should get x squared minus 3x minus 18. Okay, so the first thing it wants is the domain, right? Let's go ahead and fill in all these blanks, and then we'll go ahead and graph it once we have everything else, right? So the first thing it wants is the domain. Um, for domain, all we need to look at is where the bottom is undefined, right? And so it'll be at 6 and a negative 3, right? So the domain will be everything except those numbers, right? So we'll have a negative infinity to negative 3, right? And then we'll have negative 3 to 6, and then from 6 to an infinity, okay? So it's going to fill in those parentheses and put a union between. So that's our domain, okay? So for the y-intercept, right, we just need to plug in where the x is 0, right? Whenever we plug in an x of 0 into either this or you can plug it into this, um, you get the same thing. You get it to be at 0, 0. Um, so we have a y-intercept at the origin. x-intercept is everywhere um, that the entire numerator is 0, right? So what I'll do is I'll just say 0 is equal to 2x minus 2, or sorry, 2x squared minus 2x, right? Uh, if I take out that 2x again, right, x minus 1, we actually get um, two x-intercepts. Right? We have 1 whenever x is 0 and 1 whenever x is 1. Okay, So it is uh, 0, 0 again. We already knew that one. And then we know the other one is going to be 1, 0. Okay. All right, next we have vertical asymptotes. Uh, so this is going to be everywhere. Um, it's basically going to be where the bottom is undefined. right? So we'll have 1 at 6 and then 1 at negative 3. Okay, So I'll say vertical asymptotes is x equals 6 and then x equals negative 3, right? And so if I drew those on the graph, right, uh, here is the one for negative 3. Let me go ahead and make a line here. That's one asymptote. Okay, and then we have another one at 6. All right, and while we're at it, let's go ahead and put our x-intercepts on there. So we know there's a point right there, and we know there's another point right there. Okay. A uh, horizontal asymptote, uh, so for this, what I remember is um, since our powers on top and bottom are the same, they're both powers of 2, what I'll look at is uh, just the leading coefficients, right? So the leading coefficient is uh, 2 and 1, and so a horizontal asymptote will be at y equals 2. Okay? Uh, the next line, it asks um, if the graphs cross the horizontal asymptote. So what I'll do to figure out if it ever crosses is just say, um, since it's y equals 2, I'll just say 2 is equal to 2x squared minus 2x divided by um, x squared minus 3x minus 18. Okay, so I can solve this and figure out any spots where um, we get uh, an x value that is equal to 2, and then that will, that's, that where, that's where it will cross if it does. Okay, so what I'll do is I can cancel a 2 here. Move that over. I'll have x squared minus 3x minus 18 is equal to x squared minus x. Uh, that cancels with that, and then that turns this into a 2. So we have negative 2x equals 18. Okay, so at x equals negative 9 is where we have a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so I'll say negative 9, comma 2. Okay, so for this one, just remember all you have to do is where the horizontal asymptote is. Plug that in for y and solve to see if it ever crosses, right? So a slant asymptote, um, those only happen if we have a higher power on the top, which we do not, so I'll just write none, okay? If we wanted to fill in some points, we know we have a point at 0, 0, we have a point at 0, 1, and then we also know we have a point at negative 9, 2, okay? So I can go ahead and put that on here, negative 9, 2, so right there. All right, so um, now let's go ahead and graph it. We have a couple of points and we have our asymptotes, right? Uh, I guess I should put in my horizontal asymptote. That'll be right here. It'll be across at two, like that. Okay, so if I know it can't cross the asymptotes other than just at this part right there, right? 
uh, my line, it looks like it's going to be um, somewhere in this quadrant, right? And then it'll go down here and make a curve kind of like that, and then go over here, right? So let's try that again with uh, prettier looking lines. Okay, so I'm going to say it kind of goes under like this and goes up to the asymptote like that. And then we're going to start down here and go up, cross through our points, and then go back down. And then over here, it just doesn't touch the asymptotes, and we'll just go like that. Okay, so that's what our graph should look like. Okay, so for number 19, we have, um, we're going to be using the constant k um, to vary each of the following, right? So for part A, we have the amount of medicine, right? So we have medicine A uh, varies directly as the weight of the patient W. So directly, uh, so our constant will vary directly with that W, so it'll just be k times w, okay? For b, we have the frequency f in a vibrating string is inversely proportional to the length l, right? So inverse means the l will be uh, on the bottom of a fraction, right? So I'll do, I'll do our frequency and then our k on top because just you add the k over l, right? And so it's inversely because it's on bottom and then that k makes that factor, uh, that constant of variation, right? For part c, um, we have the variable y varies directly as with as the square root of x, right? So k times uh, the square root of x, right? And inversely as the square root of z, so over uh, the square root of z, okay? For part d, we have um, y again varies jointly as t and the cube root of q, okay? So our k, and then we have a t, and then that also varies with the cube root of, of u, right? So I'll put a little 3 for the cube root, okay? All right, so for part 20, um, it's kind of similar. We have a constant variation k uh, for each of the following. Uh, y varies jointly as w and v when w is 40 and v is 0.2, y is, uh, y is 40, right? So this is the same kind of thing where you're making the formula, only they give you numbers to plug in once it's done, right? So y varies jointly with w and v, right? So we have our y is equal to k times w times v, right? So we're given a y, a w, and a v, right? So we can plug in and get our k, right? So y is 40 uh, times k, w is also 40, and v is 0.2. So our k will be, we'll cancel that, we'll cancel that, um, we'll just be 5, okay? That's part A. Okay, for part B, we have M varies directly as X. Okay, so we'll have M equals RK times the X. Okay, and then we have X is 10 and M is 42. So 42 equals K times 10. Right, so our K will be 4.2. Um, all right, now for C, we have... Uh, T is inversely proportional to X, so it'll be uh, that same K over X, right? And then we're given X is 50 and T is 200, so 200 equals K over 50. So that will get us a K of um, 10, or, oh, sorry, 1,000. All right. All right, so for number 21, we have the surface area of a cube varies directly as the square of the length of the edge, right? And so that'll be A is equal to um, our constant and then the L squared as the square of the length of the edge. And then we're told that the surface area is 24 feet squared, so 24 is equal to K, and then the edge is 2. Okay, so what we can do is whenever we solve that, uh, oh, sorry, 2 squared, so we can solve that, we'll get 4, 24 divided by 4, is 6, so we know our k is 6, okay? And so that wants us to find the surface area of the cube when it, with an edge that's 7 feet, right? And so we, we worked through this. We were able to get our k uh, using the sentence similar to what we were doing above, right? And then we could find our k. And now we can plug it back in, right? So we have a is equal to that same k uh, times a new edge that's 7 feet, so 7 squared. So 7 squared is 49 plus 6 is going to be an area of 55. Okay. 
Uh, for number 22, it'll be uh, kind of similar. We have the force F required to break a board varies inversely as the length uh, of the board, right? So F equals, and then that K over L. Uh, if it takes 6.25 pounds of force to break a board 1.6 feet long, uh, we want to determine how much force is required to break a two foot board, right? So similar to last time, we're going to plug in a force and a length to find our K, right? So 6.25 equals K over 1.6. We'll get a K of 8.125. Okay, uh, now we have a new length, which is 2 feet, right? So F is equal to, the, to that 8.125 over a new length of 2 feet. That will get us a force of 4.0625 pounds. Okay, so for number 23, we need, to, we need to determine if the relation defines y as a function of x. So what does that mean? For, for y to be a function of x, that means for every x value, there can only be one y value that corresponds with it. Okay? So looking at part A, right? Uh, we have 10, negative 2, 6, and 0, right? All those are different x values, right? And they all get us different y values. So we could say yes that one is good, okay? For part B, two, three, and four each go to a y value, right? Um, you can have a duplicate y values, right, as this one, right? So 25 is um, the y value for three and four. That's okay, right? But what we can have is if, if it were to